All right. Um, great. So let's let's kind of jump right into these cases first off. Uh, I think the first one to start with uh, would be the um, what is it called? The Google one. Let, let me pull this up real quick. So I pull up my Google da, 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 the Google page. All right. So all right, here we are with the trademark dispute. All right. So you've got some individuals that are seeking to invalidate Google's trademark. And obviously this failed. Uh, this 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 didn't pan out. Uh, there aren't other companies <laughs> springing up with, with the Google name or, or anything like that. But uh, we, we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about trademarks and uh, their distinctiveness. And, and remember, the distinctiveness is that, um, that, that delineation between generic and suggestive, et cetera, right? And, and, and we talked there, specifically we talked about trampoline. I, I remember we talked about that quite a, a bit, but there's also Escalator and others. These are just the names of the companies that became so associated with the product itself that they've become generic, that they've moved across the scale all the way down to becoming generic. And that was the idea behind these plaintiffs trying to, like I said, invalidate Google's trademark. Did you catch, but like kind of jump in here and, and especially if you're an expert, feel free to jump in on any of these questions first. What was the, why did the judge deny their request to invalidate Google's trademark? There's a couple in there, but, but, but what did you think was the biggest one? Because the Google have seventy percent share in the market. Yeah. So I'm, no, I'm just kidding. But but the judge like and and it and it I think it was just one sentence there at the end. But it basically said if we do this, we destroy Silicon Valley or something to that effect. It was like that you know if we got rid of Google's trademark. It's not like Google disappears. They just have to create a new trademark. And, and, and they started to do things like this with the creation of Alphabet, for example, as the parent company. And then below, uh, under that, you've got Google and another company we'll talk about today, which is Waymo. Um, but, but yeah, th there was this practical side of the judge being like, I don't want to be the one to like screw the world up. Anyway, it was, it was, an, it was an interesting uh, uh, comment um i feel like the core concern is uh if if a genetic term can uh, referring to a specific is uh the genetic term the generic term should be referring to a specific good and service yeah and yeah so so, so you're getting a lot of nods from from the other students and 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 i think this is this is right this is probably what a, a lot of you were about to say that most of the like like often well let, let's go back to the trampoline example if somebody like wants to jump on a trampoline but they're jumping on not remember the jumping apparatus right so 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 maybe they're on an apparatus created or designed by leaf right? i'm just coming up with like other names of companies right like but it, but it wasn't by trampoline but everybody calls it the trampoline even though it isn't and that's the that's one of the issues here, right? Is that when people say I'm going to go Google something, where do they go? Yeah, yeah, they, they go Google. To, they go to Google.com. You're you're exactly right. And and like I said, not many people are going to Bing or Ask or I, I don't even know what else is out there to Google something. It's like it's when I say go Google it, I mean go to Google and and google it it's like some computers come with a default uh search engine of of like being and 99.9 .9 of people change that as soon as they get their computer um yeah like even my grandma changes it and if my grandma changes it you know nobody else is using being so that that's that excellent so so yeah that that's why it, it, it didn't become generic because when you say google it it means go to google all right, good. Any other thoughts on this one? Question. Yeah. 
in order for a company to suffer genericide, does it have to like does it have to be taken to a court of law like Google's or is it just it just happens and a judge rules you no longer have a trademark because so many people use your brand name for just the the generic thing, whatever it is. How does that process work? Yeah, great question. And 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 it works just like this case. It 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 happens when another company starts marketing, for example, um, their new trampoline. And trampoline says, hang on, we own that trademark, so we're gonna sue you. And and then usually it's their defense is, yeah, go ahead and sue us. Your mark became generic. And and so it's a um it's a counterclaim basically. Um and, and we'll talk about counter counterclaims when we get to Grumpy Cat because so much of that case is based on the counterclaims of the defendants in there. So so yeah, it, it's it, it doesn't happen automatically. Like judges just don't open up a case to to claim that a trademark is is now generic. Uh, the USPTO office doesn't even do that on its own, and, and so you you have to wait until you're either sued. Or you sue somebody else. Um, but the yeah. Google one is they got sued though, right? Yep. So yep. it was more like a predatory lawsuit. They were trying to hurt Google. Yeah. So so they came after Google and 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 it was their plan to use Google as a trademark, um, or yeah, as an identifier of their services. And so they just said, you know, let's sue them first to see if we can get their trademark invalidated before we go forward. So was that like their standing to sue? I mean, so like, like how did they have any standing to sue Google? Yeah, so their standing to sue is based on the fact that they are suffering damages by under the current trademark regime of not being able to use Google as they would like. That, that was their argument. It was, it was weak from the beginning. Um, but again, Google's taken some steps to protect this and uh, much like Kleenex has, like like Kleenex puts out advertisements, like "Hey, don't call tissue paper Kleenex." Chapstick probably does the same thing, like "Don't call it chapstick, call it lip balm." Um, there's lots of companies trying to protect their trademark, even though they've they're they're getting dangerously close. One way that you can protect against this is to spend a lot of money on marketing campaigns so that people stop using your name. Um, to identify the the underlying product or service. Um, it costs you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it costs a lot of money. Xerox did this because we don't do this now. Now we say, like, go make me a copy. But 20 years ago, everybody said, hey, go make me a Xerox. And, and, and Xerox rightly became concerned about this and put out lots of advertisements. I think they t- took out, like, a full-page advertisement in the New York Times, like, stop that. Um, and 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 it worked. what about uh, yeah oh i'm sorry what about like in the south though like with when they say like what we discussed about like when they said coke you know like i want a coke like i feel like that's kind of innate right it's really hard to get rid of yeah and and i think i mean yeah it's it's great right and coke is probably trying to defend that by saying well well when they say that they want a coke they mean a coke but anybody that's been to the South knows that that isn't always true, right? Like, like you ask for a Coke and, and then they say, okay, what do, like, like, what do you want? A Sprite or a A&W or, or a Coke? <laughs> it's a bizarre thing, like limited to a specific geographic area. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about that one. I, I don't know how concerned Coke is about that, to be honest. I, well, so like, wouldn't that like kind of be a a like secondary benefit to the company that people are trying to, or the, that like, it just becomes a part of their culture to, to use this company as like part of like their lingo, like, Hey, get me a Kleenex for like, yeah, go Google that. Uh huh. And it, so it, why would the company care too much if they're still benefiting off of this? Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, it, it means that you were hugely successful like trampoline, right? Um, Free advertisement kind of a thing, right? In a way. Well, I mean, the big issue is that you're going to lose that trademark, and then yeah. you're going to have to come up with something else. And that's exactly right. So, so yeah, I, I, what, what Emma's saying is is totally true, and and it means you're hugely successful. But remember, 
the value of the trademark very well could outweigh the value of the actual thing that you're selling. And so protecting that trademark could be extremely valuable. Because then you can like sell t-shirts or like cups or stuff like that, like merchandise with that trademark. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. You could expand the product line. Uh, so, so yeah, awesome questions. Yeah, like, has, but, um, on, on the whole Coke thing, like let's say it just does come to a trademark dispute. Would, would their possible defenses be, well, this is only people in Georgia that do that. Like if you go outside of that area, nobody else is doing this. And would another possible one be, but they're still all referring to Coke products. Like Sprite is a Coke product. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, I think those are really two astute observations. Um, you're not going to get your trademark invalidated if it's just a small geographic area that, that, that does the thing that, that is creating generic, well, genericide for your product. Um, and, and two, you're right, if, if, if Sprite, what, Powerade, th there's a number of these drinks that are also owned by Coke. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like w when you see a Cadillac go by, you're like, I love that General Motors car, whatever the parent company is, right? Like, I guess that's possible and it probably wouldn't cause genericide. So yeah, I, uh, Daniel, that's, that's really great. Did I hear another well, question? Well, yeah. So like, if, if like you do have your trademark set up, then, then why would it matter to this company? Why would it matter? Well, yeah. So, like, if 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 you already have your trademark set up, which I mean, if you are like this big and successful, like you do have your trademark set up, and so, like, why would it be in the interest of the company to continue to try and fight people on this? Oh, if they yeah. already have it secured. Yeah, because the whole issue is your trademark is set up, but it's not going to be set up anymore. Like, once it's invalidated through becoming generic, you lose your trademark. Now, like Trampoline, for example, it still exists. There's still a company, they own trampoline.com, but now everybody else in the world can sell trampolines. So, so just because you lose the trademark doesn't mean you have to rename your company. It just means uh, other people can use it. Uh, it it's, it's no longer protected and you can't keep other people from saying trampoline anymore. Um, it's, it's not the end of the world. It's not a death sentence. Um, but you want to keep other people oftentimes from using um, and, and, and piggybacking is, is a good way to think of it. They're piggybacking off of your goodwill, the name that you have spent millions of dollars promoting and creating, and now everybody can use it. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's what's at issue here. All right, which brings us to one of like the greatest cases, um, like maybe not as big as Theranos, but, but this is a big deal, especially as it pertains to intellectual property. And that's the case of Waymo versus Uber. Now, as you read, this case was settled, but it wasn't the end for every party involved. And, and we'll talk about Mr. Lewandowski here in a minute. Uh, he's the one in the Nike uh, zip up here. And, um, but yeah, I, I think and any of our experts want to just kind of give us the rough overview of, of what's going on here. It doesn't have to be super detailed. Oh, all... can I try? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll refer the left guy as A. I don't know how to pronounce his name. So the guy A was working in Google company before. Mm -hmm. And then after he left the Google company, he established his own like own company, own company, O-T-T-O. And after six months of starting, the, starting that company, uh, it was bought by the Uber for like $500 million or something like that. Yeah. And and then Google's and then Google sued them for for steal of the trade secret because when this guy A working in Google, he was in contact with 
Uber ready. And meanwhile, he download thousands of the files from Google yep. before he left the company. And, and as you know now, that is a big no-no. So, um, all right. So what you're reading about is the case between Waymo, also known as Google, versus Uber. And Uber had bought out Oto, which I think somebody told me it's like Swedish or Norwegian for car, um, so, so something like that. Uh, and, and Oto or Otto, however you pronounce that, was created by Mr. Lewandowski and then bought by Uber. So yeah, this is these are the general facts here. And here in the article, I've just kind of talked about a couple things here. Mainly, like I want you to kind of hone in on this. Um, it all started in 2016 after Uber acquired Odo. So I'm I'm just right here. Um, and this was the startup making self-driving trucks, founded by Lewandowski. Um, and yeah. Uber agreed to pay a reported $590 million for Odo just six months after it was founded. By the way, this, like if you're Mr. Lewandowski, $500 million for six months of startup work, not bad until you end up in jail. So, um, <laughs> amazing, like, like crazy stuff going on here. Travis Kalanick, he's, he's this guy right here. So this was the CEO of Uber. Um, a, another great success story until the success probably got to his head, or I, I don't know exactly what happened. He, he, was, he was famous for a while. This was a couple years ago, I think two or three years ago. Uh, he, he got into an Uber. Um, and, and, and anyway, the Uber driver recognized that he's like driving the CEO of the company that he drives for and, and was chatting with him. And, and uh, yeah, Mr. Kalanick like, like wasn't having it or anyway, just told him off basically, almost made fun of him for driving Ubers when it's his own company. Like, like, like the absurdity of this was, it was a terrible PR situation for Uber. And anyway, he's, He's left now, and, and Uber's under new management. Um, but, but, but he was a concern, especially going in to court, because he was going to have to testify. And the attorneys for uh, Waymo, for Google, were, were kind of excited about this because it was a way to embarrass him. Um, Kal Mr. Kalanick was known as a hothead, and they thought, you know, we'll be able to get under his skin in court. This will be embarrassing. It'll help them settle. Um, the attorneys for Uber knew this, and so they prepped Mr. Kalanick like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I think in the other article you read, it said that he was well hydrated. Like they just put up all of these water bottles so that he could continually drink and calm himself down. All, all of this was like part of the of the of the courtroom strategy uh, that that went behind it. He was well coached beforehand, and and did a great job by all accounts uh, in this case. So, um, but, but here the, the, there's a couple of things that, that we need to talk about. Um, the, the complaint, of course, if, if you're Waymo, you're gonna say, yeah, Mr. Kalanick hired, meaning Uber hired Lewandowski because they knew that Lewandowski had taken trade secrets when he left Google. And, and, and there was some support for that. Did, did any of you remember this? Like, like, like what, what evidence did they have? It wasn't necessarily proof, but they had some evidence. Part of it was when, when did Lewandowski and Kalanick start talking to each other? Do you remember that? <laughs> Uh, like before, telling kids before he to left, <laughs> so he doesn't get called on. Um, but but yeah, yeah, they, they started speaking like before Lewandowski even left Uber, and and that I mean it's not proof, but it shows something may have been up. And they had they had interesting recordings or evidence of these jam sessions. Do, do you remember that? And they were like lidars, the sauce, and all these kind of embarrassing. It was almost like a like a frat party 
when they would meet together. Um, and, and, and again, all of that is embarrassing. It's not necessarily proof, but it makes, it makes Uber look bad. Like, like they were up to something. Right. And anyway, I, I love this, but like, this is 500 million right there. Uber offered 500 million before the trial started. They said, Hey, Google Waymo, we'll give you $500 million and this all goes away. And and it's interesting, like you have to read between the lines here because we don't have all of the information, but, um, but we do know that it was probably Uber's attorney that said, hey, they haven't accepted, and this goes back to contract law. They said, hey, Google hasn't accepted the $500 million offer yet. Pull it, take it away. Let's go to court. And luckily, thankfully, Uber listened to their attorney there. And uh, I, I think that that, well, not that I think, it was a, a really good decision. And a lot of that comes down to um, this here. I'm trying to move this. Oh, let's put this over. Uh, I'm just going to drop this down the bottom. A lot of this comes down to my legal hero. So this is a picture of Arturo Gonzalez. He was the attorney for Uber. Now I've looked into this guy. Uh, this is the real, like, like we started this semester talking about suits and, and all of that. This is the real Harvey Specter right here. Like, like this guy is it. And he's the real deal too. Um, his life story is amazing. Uh, child to some migrant farmers in California, uh, did okay in school, and then had somebody that, that believed in him and started pushing him. Uh, he ended up going to UC Davis for his undergrad, which if you're familiar with the California system, UC Davis is okay. It's not, not anything great. It's, it's UC Davis, but did extremely well at UC Davis and got into Harvard Law. Um, after Harvard, uh, he, he could have gone anywhere, but he ended up at a, at a large law firm. And um, part of the, th and, and now he's a partner there, but part of the thing that he does that I really admire is that he dedicates, uh, uh, I think it's like 25% of his time or something to pro bono cases. And, and he focuses on migrant farm kind of issues, just, just other um, plaintiffs that would never have the money to take on big cases, he takes those cases and uh, has had a lot of, uh, like a lot of success. Again, like when I grow up, basically I want to be Mr. Gonzalez. So, so good attorney. Uber hires him wisely. And again, I think he put the brakes on that offer. He said, pull that, you know, they never accepted. So let's pull that $500 million offer. Let, let me go to court for a little bit. And, and the board of Uber agreed and, and he gets to go to work and uh, he does a lot of things here. Now, remember, all of this comes down to trade secrets, all right? This case comes down to trade secrets. Did Mr. Lewandowski trade, take trade secrets? So I want you to, to put yourself in Mr. Gonzalez's shoes right now. What are you going to do and what line of questioning are you going to use to poke holes in Google's argument that, that Mr. Lewandowski stole trade secrets, All right? Think about that for a little bit. Um, I wonder if... So, Brother Hales, quick question. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think we already covered this, but... If let's say I'm working for Google and I pour like all of my time into this one project and you know I, I build up these files and then I decide to leave Google and start my own company, do those files that I did, like let's say I was working on them by myself, are those Google's or would that be validating a trade secret if I took those with me because I created them? Yeah, I, I, that's a great foundational question here. So let's, let's talk about that real quick. Um, usually, anything that you create, 
especially at a tech company like Google, Apple, Tesla, these companies all have these policies. But, but, but even if it's not written out in the policy, that there's case law that suggests that anything that you create for your employer becomes the intellectual property of your employer. Again, if, if you were hired to create a robot that does whatever, they get the patent to that. If, however, you, you, you go to Google and you're a coder, but then you come home and you create a robot on your own time, on your own dime, on, on your own computer, um, yeah, products and, and, and supplies that, that you have purchased yourself. These aren't like things that you take home. Uh, if you do that, then there's an argument that, uh, that, that again, that's your own creation and you have the rights to that. Uh, now, that doesn't mean Google's not going to try to sue you to get the rights to that thing. Um, and, and, and there's cases where tech companies have done just that. But it just means you've got a pretty good argument that that's your intellectual property because you created it yourself. Okay, so yeah, good, good question. Uh, I'm actually going to try something. I'm going to put you into two groups. And I'll jump in between both and I'll tell you which side you're on. Um, and, and then, yeah, you'll designate like a speaker or something. And then I think this will be kind of cool because, uh, we can have a little argument in class. All right. So I'm creating this now. Hold on. If I'm not right there, I'm going to come in in a second. So you can just hang out, and sing songs or something. All right. Let's do this. All right, go ahead and jump into those rooms that you've been invited to. All right, you guys are going to be group one. All right, I'm going to make you, you're going to argue for Google. All right, so, so yeah. Let, let, let's do that. So you're going to argue for Google. And then when we come up, so talk, I'll give you like two minutes, just come up with ideas for why Mr. Lewandowski stole your trade secrets and why it's a trade secret. Okay. So you'll get to go first. And in, like, like I said, give me about two minutes and then we'll bring everybody back. Okay. All right. I'll see you guys. All right. So you guys are group number two. Uh, I want you to chat among yourselves, and I'm going to give you two minutes. I want you to, you, you guys get to be my hero, by the way. Like, you get to be Mr. Gonzalez. This is, this is the group that I would want to be in. And you're going to poke holes. Like, like you're going to talk about why what Mr. Lewandowski did wasn't to steal a trade secret. Okay? So uh, just elect, like, a spokesperson among yourselves. And like I said, in two minutes, I'll bring you back. And then we'll have a little, well, an argument in class. It's a law class. I'm happy to do that. So, all right, two minutes. Go ahead. Mm. What do you guys think? Um, I don't know. Would that be anything we could use? I think that could be possible. Possibly use that, right? Because they knew that he had all those trade secrets, right? They knew about him. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to steal and like help you out too much, but just focus on the fact that he downloaded a million files or whatever it was right before he left. Like that looks suspicious. Okay. So, so, so that was Google's main argument. Um, and then he went and started like all of it's suspicious, but okay. That's just one idea. I'm going to, all right. What right. hills? How, how? What was the? Um, I don't remember if it said it. The time frame from when he left and downloaded to when he started it. I, I it was like know. eight months. Okay. Yeah, it, it was. It was fairly quick afterwards, and then and then he only operated auto for like six weeks before getting bought or six months. Sorry, before getting bought out by Uber. So it's it's fairly quick in terms of business 
stages, mm-hmm. uh, the, the way that all of this happened. Okay. So yeah, that looks suspicious too. So yeah, good. Yeah, I was good. like, that's really quick for business. Yeah, cool. Well, and I think going off of like the whole poaching idea with hiring, they can say that he had like the company not only had intent to hire him, but he had intent to seek out other companies to be hired and maybe a way to embezzle out information instead of money, but take information out and find ways to find higher benefits and be better paid by other companies. Wasn't he forced to sign a non-compete by Google? Maybe I am not. Yes, but if that's in California. Which doesn't apply. It's basically like a law that nobody obeys. Yes. So how could we defend that being Google if they attack us with with the... Makes sense. Um, I think that's where we can spin it off and saying, um, going off of where the trade secrets are and maybe if he went out of the state to travel on projects because then wouldn't that automatically come into effect because he's now out of the state of California. So that becomes a legal contract that you can use. All right, we give everybody a couple minutes to get back in. By the way, it looks like all right. All right. So we're back. Uh, let's hear the spokesperson from group one. Let's hear the, the attorney counselor for Google slash Waymo. Okay. So I was chosen as the spokesperson and in our defense, we look at what uh, Uber has done as poaching. They specifically went with intent to our company, looked, maybe looked through our employees and found one who they saw as you know, compromisable who would not only but willingly look in, download Google files, steal trade secrets from us, and then in a short amount of time, turn around, go to Uber, and then use those uh, trade secrets to then build up Uber and give them the same technology that we were working on. All right. Yeah. Like the the fact scenario almost speaks for itself, right? You you know you're talking to Lewandowski while he's still working for us. You have jam sessions and then take our files. It's like it's, well, and you can see that there's huge intent behind it because they didn't just randomly meet each other. They intentionally sought each other out and intentionally talked about it. Yeah, and I mean. When you're putting together a case, it's interesting, right? Because you don't need to prove intent. Like, and, and, and that makes sense. You can't get into Lewandowski's head and say, this is exactly what he was thinking here. And this is exactly what he was thinking here. We don't have that. So we have to look to circumstantial evidence. Um, and yeah, Tirza did a great job of kind of mapping this out. When it comes to circumstantial evidence, you're looking at motivations, you're looking at um, and, and by the way, what helps with motivation, $590 million helps with motivation, right? And anyway, that, that amount of money is hard for me to comprehend. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's true for a lot of you as well. Um, all right, so great. Here's a good job. All right, let's bring in the, the, the defense. Uh, let, let's hear from Uber's attorney. Hey, I was chosen as tribute. <laughs> uh, our argument is and the law says to be a secret a trade secret it has to be a secret so if it was so easy for him to download these files have access to these files see these files who else had access to these files it doesn't look like it was really a secret it doesn't look like they were really trying to make this a secret if they had easy access also they don't have proof that he actually used those files he could have just reverse engineered and used what he remembered from it and use like different technology. So 
that's what we thought about. All right, awesome. And and Mr. Gonzalez did discuss this. Like like one of his first questions was, "You're Google." All right, so so he got like Google's well Waymo's uh, head up there, um, like Dimitri something, and and he says, "You're Google." Like like you create all the security systems in the world, basically. What alarms went off when Mr. Lewandowski uh, downloaded these thousands and thousands of files? And, and he just stood there and, and uh, I mean, that's a good question, right? Like you're Google, what do you mean an alarm didn't go off somewhere when somebody starts downloading the database? Um, pretty awesome right there. But then, and, and, and I think most of you like, like, yeah, we, we, we would have come up with that. that. That's the line of questioning that you go down when you want to poke holes in somebody else's argument that it's a trade secret. You're like, wow, you know, that's, it's interesting you call it a trade secret. Um, I hacked into your system and got it. Like, you're, you're, you, you clearly don't think this is that big of a secret or it's publicly accessible, et cetera. You, 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 you get it. Brother Hells. Yeah. Couldn't Google argue that they, because I know that company, they try to work together in lots of groups and they like having added in uh, ideas. Yeah. Couldn't Google find that this was a trusted employee who they valued and wanted to be able to have more worth to the company by being able to work on projects to add benefit to? Yes. So it wasn't so much that he stole, like, yes, he did steal the documents, but he had access to them because he was a trusted employee who they wanted to help benefit the project. Yeah, and, and, and that's a great counter argument. And, and Google, Waymo definitely went down this route. They're like, you know, Lewandowski wasn't just the, the, the intern. Right? Like, he was the senior engineer, one of the founding members of our LIDAR self-driving department. And, and, and so, of course, he'd have access to this. It w was, was their counter argument. And, and so um, I, I kind of had a question about that, because if it's if you are an employee, um, is isn't it like a protocol to maybe have a contract or something in place that would prevent something like that getting out? Especially if you're, if you're dealing with some sensitive information, if you do value your trade secret, because they know Coca-Cola, their trade secret is so high that they won't even let the same people who know the recipe fly on the same plane. They have to take different planes to the same location. Yeah. So they have some high level protocols. So wouldn't like a contract in place indicate that? Yeah, and, and okay, so yeah, Emma, remind me to come back to that because that is a super important. And, and this case ends, but it, the headaches didn't end for Lewandowski. So, so yeah, oh, good, awesome, awesome comment. Okay, so, all right, so anyway, Google comes back with this counter argument, like, look, he's, he's, he's a senior member, blah, blah, blah. So Arturo Gonzalez has to, has to take this a step further, and he came up with a line of questioning that I just think is brilliant. Like, like this is my, I, I, am, I am having a bromance right now, okay? So basically, he says, um, he asked him, I'm getting so excited about this that, I need to chill out because I'm cool. Okay, I'm cool. Um, he says, uh, he asked them about their bonus structure. So, so again, he's asking Google, Waymo, like, like, do you have a bonus? Do workers earn bonuses if they come up with something that's so awesome that it gets a patent? And Dimitri, um, I can't remember his last name, but, but he's the one that, that's on the stand uh, for, for Google. And he says, yeah, we, we have that. Um, if, if any of our employees come up with something that's so great that, that, we get, that, uh, that, that we get a patent for it, then we're going to give that employee a bonus. It's an incentive to come up with inventions that we can patent. And, and Mr. Gonzalez says, that's great. I mean, that, that, that's a wonderful program. Um, I imagine that, that if, if an employee comes up with something so great that, that you don't want to patent it, that you want to keep it as your trade secrets, you also give them a bonus, don't you? And, and, and some of you are catching on because they're like, no, we, we don't have that. And, and Mr. Gonzalez is like, oh, interesting that the, you have a bonus structure for patents 
but not for trade secrets. And, and, and remember the definition of trade secret is something so valuable that you want to keep it secret. And he's like, so these things that you're calling trade secrets that Mr. Lewandowski took, you didn't think they were that important, did you? Because you didn't, you didn't have a bonus system set up for those items. And, and, and imagine you're Dimitri, you're like, uh, well, uh, we didn't know, it's, it's hard to know what a, trade, or what a trade secret is. Anyway, it's like, he, he starts bumbling and Mr. Gonzalez says, I understand, thank you. You're dismissed, like no further questions. And, and that day was devastating for Google. Google gets back to the office and that, okay, so this is when things start changing. This is when now it's, um, now it's, now it's Google calling up um, Uber saying, hey, we'd like to settle. And now, remember, Uber had already offered to settle for 500. Yeah, they pulled that back. But now, now it's Google, Waymo trying to settle. And anyway, did you, did you see the final numbers that, that they picked here? Um, they, they settled for about $250,000 worth of stock. So, so again, th this is another reason that Arturo Gonzalez is my hero. He, I think he had like a week, two weeks in court. But in that week or two weeks in court, he saved his client, Uber, about $250 million. All right, this is an attorney that is worth his, I don't even know what his hourly rate is. It's probably over $1,000 an hour. but worth every single penny because he wiped the floor or I should maybe like calm my fanboy boyishness down a little bit. He did a great job in court. All right. This is, man. Oh, so good. All right. So good. I'm going to chill out. All right. So any, uh, any questions about that or comments? Yeah. Uh, I remember I saw an article, the guy received the bonus from Google for inventing just like at the, at the last paragraph said, like the Miss Lever do something like that, received a 1200 million bonus for his work. Yeah. On Google self-driving car. Yeah. So he was getting bonuses there for the work he was doing. Yeah. But it, but but it, it wasn't why? tied to the trade secrets is, is the key there. Yeah. Yeah. Good, okay. good question. All right. So. Um, that leads us to our last little thing here. Uh, we, we get to talk about Grumpy Cat. Now, this was a longer, th this you actually read the transcript of uh, the, the judge's opinion here. Um, and, uh, but again, you've, you've done this a number of times through the semester, so uh, you can cry to somebody else about that. Um, and anyway, I, I love this one. Uh, okay. So, so here we've got grumpy cat background. Let, let, let me just kind of explain this to you. Uh, you've got a couple parties here, grumpy cat limited, and, and I'll just call them grumpy cat from here on out. Think of that. It, those are the owners of the cat, by the way, some of you, you, like every one of you has seen grumpy cat. I'm sure. Did you know that grumpy cat's real name is tartar sauce? Like I had no idea. So anyway, this is going to come invaluable to you someday. You'll be at a cocktail recruiting cocktail party for s some company. And, and, and if Grumpy Cat is ever mentioned, you can bring up this fact. His actual name is Tartar Sauce. And then you'll get the job and you can thank me. All right. Um, but they're the ones that, that own the cat and some genetic problem with the cat's face that made it always look grumpy, uh, but ended up making it worth millions of dollars. So. Uh, they own the rights, the trademark Grumpy Cat, as well as copyright, mostly pictures of the cat uh, itself. Is tartar sauce a boy or girl? I don't know. It. Well, it, it's an it. Um, and, and so, yeah, uh, they own all of this, and they want to get money out of this cat. So uh, if, if you want to get money out of the cat, well, you've got to create products. Uh, you can't, you're not going to make a ton of money off of memes or just suing people for copyright infringement with your memes. So um, yeah, it's, it's time for them to start cashing in on Grumpy Cat. So, so they hire, or I should say license to Grenade Beverage, who later becomes, um, what is it? Grumpy Cat 
drinks or something like that. It, it, it gets a little confusing because they both use grumpy cap. Um, grumpy beverage is what the defendants end up calling themselves. So I'll just call them the beverage company and then grumpy cat owners of the mark itself. Um, what's the main issue? Like, like if, if I asked you after reading this, what does this case come down to? What, what, what's, what, what would you say? Contract terms, essentially. Yeah, it's basically contract terms. Specifically, let me um, let me jump over to. Uh, I'm going to pull this up just so you can see it real quick. There we go. All right, so uh, there we go. All right, so here it is. This intro is just kind of delineating what's what's going on. But here in highlight, like, like I highlighted kind of the main issue. So, so the judge writes this um, opinion, much like you write your briefs, right? There's like case facts, issues, rules, et cetera. Um, and, and yeah, uh, the, the main issue here is that the beverage company used the name and image beyond what was authorized in the licensing agreement. Now, like, like when we come down here, this is, this is really it. Um, the agreement granted Grenade the right to use Grumpy Cat's name and image to sell a line of Grumpy Cat coffee products. That's it. I mean, that's, that's what this whole, like, 13, whatever this is, pages comes down to. What the heck is a line of Grumpy Cat coffee products? What does that mean? All right, and... Um, and I like this case for a number of reasons. One, it shows that if you own intellectual property, you can license that out. And that's what Grumpy Cat did in this case. Um, and, and it's governed by the contract itself, but here we've got a problem. The contract is ambiguous because, again, put yourself in the shoes of the beverage company. What does a line of coffee products mean to you? What do you want it to mean, I should say? Just lots of products. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. So the beverage company was like, it's not just iced coffee. We're gonna do those, um, it gets down, like, like further down in here, it talks about how they wanna do those little like cup things. Um, what, what do they call those? I know this is awkward like for a bunch of Mormons to be talking about coffee, but it, you, you, those like instant coffee cup things that you see in hotels. Anyway, they wanted to do that. They wanted to do grumpuccinos. Like the, the, there was all of this beyond just the iced coffees that, uh, that, that the company wanted to do. Now, why? Here's another great question. Why did Grumpy Cat, the, the parent company, why did they want to stop the beverage company? Why did they want to kick them out? You accountants should, should have been all over this, by the way. Is it because maybe they were not making as much as they had foreseen before? Because foreseen before they probably thought they were going to do one product and get like X amount. But because they were doing all this product, they're making way more than they what actually the grumpy cat actually was receiving, right? Yeah. And yeah, let, let me jump down to this. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it really centers around this. The license agreement required a monthly accounting. They said, hey, beverage company, tell us how much you're making. And, and how often did beverage ever give this? Like none. They, they would send a spreadsheet like, hey, uh, it looks like we're going to make this much. And, and Grumpy Cat's like, that's not an accounting. Okay. Like, like, anyway, you could basically see them screaming at them like, we need to see your financials not your best guess about what you're making. It's like, how amateur was, was this beverage company about this? Um, yeah, they kept requesting the accountant, the attorney for Grumpy Cat sent multiple emails. You can see this right here. Like, come on. And, and we're not gonna give permission for you to expand your product line until you give us this accounting. They of course never did. and so. Um, the lawsuit ensued. But I think the grumpy, the, the, I should say the beverage company has a pretty good argument here because 
they're saying a product line of coffee beverages is more than iced coffee beverages. It's also the instant cup thing and it's it's all this like geez, they, they could have come up with like well, I guess it's a coffee line, coffee beverages. I was gonna say they could have come up with like grumpy cat coffee flavored ice cream, but that's probably beyond uh, the, the the rational definition of beverages. But they're saying, look, the contract itself says this, judge, we're allowed to do more. And and so the way that I see this case, let, let me wrap this up real quick. The way that I see this case, it's a great lesson in making sure that you don't mess up your contracts. If If you're going to write a contract, make sure that it isn't ambiguous. Have somebody else read it. Like, like get it out there and, and be very careful with the contracts that you write and sign uh, because any ambiguity can cause problems. This, this lawsuit was going to cost tens of thousands of dollars at least um, just to get to this stage. Um, yeah, likely up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so you can save that money by writing a contract that accurately depicts what the parties really want and, and where that meeting of minds really is. All right. So cool. Let's just, let's just end it there. You're probably cased out right now. So um, let's just end.